that's great, that's nice, like that church, or don't like that church, and that, that was biblical. Jesus is not looking for you to, to praise this sermon or give some affirmation that, yes, that's biblical. Well, of course it's biblical. It's him speaking. What he expects you to do is come to a decision and make some choices here. That's, that's what this is. Brethren, and, and if you make the right decision, you're going to be among the few. But it's always been that way. It's always been that way. Brethren, it, Christians have always found themselves in the despised minority. That's always the way. Now consider carefully. Many travelers are on the broad way. But perhaps it's not who you might imagine. You see, it's very, it, it's very easy for us to say, oh, we're in church. We're in the church meeting. And there's lots of people out there, masses and multitudes. We're few compared to them. I recognize we can look at things that way, and that's, that's not totally a, I, I mean, yes, people that don't even identify with God's people, of course we know where they're at. But the people in these pairs all the way through here are not such as you might think at first notice or first glance. This is not the godless masses. I mean, look, look, just look here. Verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And so, and basically he breaks all this down into there's two types. There's a healthy tree and there's a disease tree and there's good fruit and there's bad fruit. But do you recognize what he's dealing with here? He's dealing with people that look like sheep. People who look like sheep, but are not sheep. And when you go to verse 21, look at this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? He could say, well, not everybody who follows Allah will enter the kingdom of heaven. No, no, no. You see what he says? Not everybody who uses my name, not everybody who relates to me and talks Jesus Christ talk. You see, that's what he's saying. But we got people that are using the lingo. These are, these are people that are in the church. These are people that are among professing Christians. These are would-be followers. And they're using his name, Lord, Lord. And you see what they did. They, they, they say on that day, verse 22, many are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not? See, Lord, Lord, not just Lord. It's double. It's, it's like, it's profound. It's emphasized. Did we not prophesy? See, we were doing things. Lord, we were doing these religious things. We prophesied. We cast out demons in your name. You notice that? It's always in his name, in your name. It, this wasn't done in the name of some Hindu God. This was done in the name of Jesus Christ, in your name. We did mighty works in your name. And then he says, I don't know who you are. I don't know you. You are a worker of lawlessness. You say, wait a second. We prophesied. We did mighty works. We take the Lord's Supper. We came to church meetings. He said, I never knew you. You see who he's talking about here. And when you go on and you go on to verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them over against verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, you recognize who these people are. These people are sitting under the preaching. These are people that have listened to the sermons from the Sermon on the Mount. You see, he is not interested in whether people come and hear the preached sermon. He's interested in whether you actually have a living faith that clings to the Christ and to the truth that he proclaims. You see, your faith is nothing if it doesn't hear these words and say, yes, Lord. I believe you are king and you are Lord and you are God and you are the only Savior. I believe you came from heaven. I believe you came with the truth. I believe these words are from God. I believe this is the way to eternal life. And I am not going anywhere else. I may be weak. Lord, I see it. Poverty of spirit. But where are we going to go? And you're just like his disciples. You're just like Peter. Where are we going to go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We're not going anywhere. I mean, we may fall, we may do this, we may do that, but we're clinging to you. And if you tell us to go through this, if you tell us to enter at this point, we're going in there. Whatever may follow. You see, you follow him no matter what the consequences are. He never guaranteed you you wouldn't die, you wouldn't be persecuted. In fact, he said you would be persecuted. And it's very likely you could die. It's not guaranteed. But brethren, this, this is it. These, these people, you see... You see who the people are. The many 
on the broad way. These are religious folk. These are some of you. Brethren, there's no question about it. I, I don't doubt that at all. We have people in this very room right now that are proclaiming to be followers of Christ. And on Judgment Day, there are people in this room that will go to the right, and there are people in this room that will go to the left. And there won't be any real mystery about it. When the facts are laid on the table, if you're on the left, it's going to be because you heard. You might have, you know, debated, thought about the truthfulness. You might have said, yeah, that's true. You might have looked at that and appreciated it. You might have done whatever. But you heard it and you did not do it. You were happy with just mechanical religion. And you know, one of the things he said is judge not. I mean, there's not to be hypocritical judgment. You were just happy going on and judging. You were just happy going on with the hypocrisy. See, that's, that's really what went behind the scribes and the Pharisees who had a righteousness that you better have a better one. It was hypocrisy. They appeared to be something on the outside. They appeared to be sheep on the outside, but inwardly, they were altogether something else. Brethren, this is easy religion. The way is easy. This is a broad way, and it's easy. And you know what it says over the top? It says, the sign over the top says, come to heaven the easy way. And the vast majority say, yeah, yeah, sign me up. That's what I want. I don't want to go to that terrible hell place. I don't want to suffer for my sin, but I want it easy. Show me the easy way to heaven. And you know what? They look at the sign and they go in with the crowd and they walk with the crowd, but they never really pay attention to where this road goes. This is why God's way can never be discovered by appealing to the majority opinion. Do you hear what I'm saying? The majority, Jesus says, are on the wrong way. Don't appeal to the majority. Don't appeal to the crowd. You see, the few, even, my wife says it. When my wife was growing up, she was not a Christian. And she went to a church. And she said, you know what? There were a few people in the church who were oddballs. She said once she got saved, she recognized they were the true Christians. Brethren, that's so often the way. The majority, the majority are always wrong. Because the majority are always on the wrong way. That's clearly to travel the narrow way. You, you remember what Paul said. That we were dead in our trespasses and sins and we were following the course of this world. You see the picture? We were, in the, we were in the stream. We were in the flow of the majority. But what happens? When God saves you, there's a 180 degree turnaround and you suddenly go against the majority, against the world, against, against brethren. You go the other way. The Christian, the Christian. Why is it that people call I mean, you know what I have found throughout the years when I meet Christians, I mean, you go to different places and they're like, my family's calling me a fanatic. That, that is so common. Brethren, I'll tell you this, you can almost smell the real deal just because you got the majority calling them a fanatic or calling them a cult or calling them this or calling them that. The, the, Christian, the true Christian is always somebody unusual. There's so few. You make a break with the world. You make a break with the crowd. You make a break with the vast majority of people. And you know what happens? You also have to make a break a lot of times with your closest friends and your closest family members. This is it. This is, this is the way. The Christian way of life is not popular. That's why so few are on it. D.A. Carson has said that the... It, it doesn't, the, the narrow way doesn't win many popularity contests. He's absolutely right. It's not popular. It's radical. It's fanatical. It's unusual. It's strange. It's different. That's it. Brethren, you know what happens? I, this happened to me. I mean, you know what? I ran with the crowd. But as soon as God saved me, you stop running with the crowd. 
And I found that I didn't even run with the crowd that was in the first churches that I went to because they, they, were, they were content to have the kind of religion where you could still be a slave to your sin. I looked at these people and it, brethren, I'll tell you, like I said before, Bunyan hit this right. But one of the things about getting on this narrow way, it's intensely personal. You go in there by yourself. You don't go in with the crowd and you don't go in there with your family. You don't go in there with a whole bunch of others. You come in there by yourself. Formerly, our identity was with the crowd. There's no, there's no question about that. Brethren, you know what happens? It can, it can feel lonely at times. But you just you think of Pilgrim. He walked that lonely road. Sometimes he had faithful at his side. Sometimes he had hopeful at his side. But you think about them. Oh, you had people going back the other way. You had people going off in different directions. But they kept on the master's road. And they kept their face towards the celestial city. Brethren, no matter how many doubting castles you have to go through or you know, those enchanted grounds that wanted to put them to sleep or hills of difficulty. They had the celestial city in their sights. Brethren, this is the way to glory. And we don't want to forget that. That is the appeal of this hard path. Brethren, at one time we rushed madly along with the gang. But then what happens? Salvation puts a sudden halt to that. So... Here it is, brethren. There's only two choices. One of the things that you have to take notice of in Jesus' teaching here is this. Christ puts a limitation on what he allows us to believe. See, what do you mean? Well, you know what? If you go ask the world's opinion, they'd like to just tell you there's all sorts of choices. Ruby and I evangelizing years ago, we, we went up to a man. He was a Catholic. And began talking to him. He seemed like the sweetest old man imaginable. We're talking to him about the way to heaven. He said, well, here's, here's his opinion. I think that getting to heaven is like getting to Austin. There's many ways. You drive from San Antonio to Austin. You can take that road over there, that highway, or you can take that highway. I said, no, sir. There's only one way. His fangs came out. This sweet, lovely old man turned into a monster all of a sudden. Brethren, there aren't a lot of ways. Jesus doesn't allow us that. You know what? We, we would prefer to be given choices. The reality is, which one of you would not sign up for an easy way that went to eternal life? That's the choice we all want. And I'll tell you, I, what I think is happening here, the very reason he goes to false prophets right after this, the very reason he would go immediately to those who appear to be Christians but are not, the reason he would go there right away is because of the very reality that he just set forth two choices. But you know what? Men don't want just two choices. They want a third choice. They want that easy way to heaven. And you know what? There are all sorts of prophets and preachers who are ready to give men that message and to tickle their ears with that. They're everywhere. And I think that's why he goes there just next. We want an easy path that leads to life. Brethren, there's always only been two ways. And there's only been one way that goes to life. And you have two choices. It's, it's been, you can find this all the way through Scripture. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Joshua said it. 
If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you remember what it was like on Mount Carmel with Elijah. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. You know what? People like to be uncommitted. That's a reality. They love to be uncommitted. That's one of the reasons why I think it's really good for people to verbally commit to wanting to be one of us as a church. I, th I think that's great because people don't like commitment. And Jesus doesn't allow us the comfortable solutions that we might propose. Any e easy ways? No, not, not that. So we need to ask ourselves this. How does a person enter? Because that's what he's really telling us here. Enter by the straight gate or enter the narrow gate. How do we do that? Well, reality is we, we need to recognize this. Jesus is clearly emphasizing that a time for a decision has come. He says, enter by the narrow gate. We need to recognize the absolute nature of the choice before us. Do you hear what I'm saying? We need to recognize the nature of what he is calling us to. If you listen to this sermon and you walk away just basically resolved to improve your life a little bit, you've missed it. That's not what he's calling you to enter. He's not saying, read this sermon and now, you know, try to fix one thing in your life. That, he, he's not, he hasn't preached this so that you resolve to simply improve a little bit. That's not the decision he's calling us. The choice before us, there's no room for you to set your opinions over against the Lord's in this. He's calling for a radical lifestyle all out. So we need to ask this, where's the narrow gate? You know, when evangelist came to Christian and Pilgrim's Progress, he said, do you see that gate over there? And he looked over there and he said, no, I don't see that gate. He said, do you see the light over there? He said, yes, I see the light. He said, keep that light in your eyes and you keep going. What does that mean for us? I mean, for one, that's Bunyan's analogy. But where is this? Jesus says to enter this gate. Where is it? Well, it's not back here somewhere. It's not out those doors. It's where is it? We sit here. This is a spiritual reality. We, we need to ask ourselves, where is this that we might enter? I mean, the picture that Jesus paints here is nice and everything, but as I sit here in this place at this time, how do I, how do you practically enter this place? Well, consider when Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. He's clearly calling us to do something. He's calling us to action. This demands a decision. It demands commitment. This isn't something to just read about and, and be interested in. That's not, and, and then to become passive because you've got this idea that God is sovereign. And you know, because God's sovereign, God saves who he will. And so I can't really do anything. No, that's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus does not say, okay, preach the sermon. Now sit over there and wait for God to zap you and bring you through this narrow gate into this narrow way so that you might end up at life. That's not what he's saying. He appeals to his hearers and he says, you need to enter this gate. He's, he, don't be passive about this. Jesus demands to control our lives. You recognize that's what this sermon is about. He said in, in a parallel to this over in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? This is, this is really what we're faced with. You can't just look at this from a distance. You have, every one of us in this room, we have to deal with the Lord Jesus Christ. Your path takes you to him. You have to deal with him. You have to deal with his words. And if you say, I will not, I'm turning my back. Listen, it's only a matter of time till you come face to face with him. What you want to do is hear him and recognize this is the one before whom I must stand. I have to die. There is a judgment day. My life is short. He is Lord. He is King. He is the only Savior. He came to show us the way. He came to be a voice for God. He came to be truth to us. He came to be the door. That's, that's key. Where's the gate? Christ is the gate. When you say that imagery, it doesn't help me a whole lot more. Because I don't see Christ and well, listen, you see him by faith in this book and in what he just got done teaching. That's where you see him. The gate is him. 
See, it's all got to do with him. It's got to do with surrendering to him. It's got to do with hearing his words. It's got to do with believing that he is the one who can save me thoroughly to make me able to, capable to live a life like this. He's able to take me all the way through this straight gate and down this narrow way. And because he says, follow me, he's saying, I'll never leave you or forsake you. No matter how narrow it gets, I will be there at your side. I will be with you. I will walk with you. I will help you. I will strengthen you. You remember how virtue went out of him to help heal other people? He's got the healing virtue. He, he's going to be there with us. That's what this is all about. How do you enter? How can you find this? Well, brethren, the hard way is a way to be walked. It has to do with you purposing, you coming to commitment. You, you recognize that's what this is all about. When he says to his disciples, you guys going to leave too? When all the crowds were leaving, see, there's the many. The many got on the boat and they're out of here. And he said, you guys going to go too? Where are we going to go? You see, that's what he's calling for. He's calling for people that say, no matter how hard this is, where are we going to go? I'm not bailing out on this because you're the Savior. You've got the words of eternal life. I believe you. I believe you who are who you said you are. I believe you came to do what you said you came to do. I believe that you are my only hope. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be just like Levi. You call me to follow you. I'm leaving that tax table and everything that I knew and all the crowds and all my buddies and all my friends and all the world. I'm leaving them behind and I'm following you. you I don't know what the end of this might be. This, this might not go well for me for all I know. But you're my only hope. I'm going with you all the way to the end. That's what this is about. That's, that's the faith. And what he's asking here is, does this govern you? See, when he gets to the end, he says, you got these people over here, and what are they doing? They're hearing and not doing. What he's asking is, when you hear my words, do they govern you? Do they control you? Do, do you hear my voice? Or is this just some nice religious talk? You heard the sermon, great, you go on your way. Now you think about cars and food and girlfriends and sex and televisions and life and work and, you know, the stuff you've got to buy and, and you're just you're going to go on. Success and where you're heading. And, or does his word ring in your ear? Do you think about it all the time? Is this what controls you? This involves a very definite act of me and, and it, it's going to be the result of him controlling me and my actual decisions, my practice. This, is, this just involves a very definite act of the will. This calls me to recognize that this is God's truth. Christ calls me to conform. Jesus expects us to say, I'm going to give myself to him and and." to the life that he directs me to live. Come what may, I, I'm not going to consider the consequences of following him. I believe in him. I believe that what he says is true. I believe all that. You know what the psalmist said? The psalmist said, why are you cast down on my soul? You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones jumped all over that reality about talking to yourself. You know what? That's very healthy. I had John over the other night and I came to the front door and I opened it up and he's out there talking. I thought his kids were out in the car. I said, who are you talking to? He said, oh, I talk to myself. Now, see, some people could look at that and say, that's crazy. No, that's Christian. That's what the psalmist did. You're supposed to be talking to yourself. My wife will come sometimes. Are you talking to yourself? Um, that can be a sign that something's wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> listen, the reality is we need to be talking to ourselves. Talk to yourself. You ought to be able to talk to yourself this way. You know what? I do believe that what Jesus said right here is impossible for me to live in my own power. I recognize that. But see, that's the nature of poverty of spirit. I can't do this myself. And yet, you know what? He says, I must live this out. So I can't, but I must. Well, how do you do? Lord, I believe that if you're calling me to do something that I know in myself I can't do, that I'm trusting you, that you're going to make up all that I need here to be able to live this out. And I know that even when I fail to do this, you've told me in your word that if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive, and I have an advocate with the Father. So I'm trusting this. You're going to empower me, but you're also going to walk there with me and be my advocate. I'm following you on this. I know this is going to be a hard road. 
but you told your disciples that walk this hard road to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. So something about this hard road, and as difficult as it might be right now, the Apostle Paul was led to believe momentary light affliction over against what's at the end of this road. Brethren, I'll tell you, the hard way is the way you want to go because what's at the end is an eternal way of glory that you don't want to miss. No matter how hard this way is, it's only momentary. So you want to talk to yourself. You want to remind yourself of these realities. Think, think, think. Have I heard his voice in these words? Is this him? Is this him speaking? Is he going to, is, listen, do you think that the Christ that spoke these words is going to be okay with you hearing them and not really applying them to your life? Just to basically make slight little modifications to your life or to say, no. You know what? I've got faith in him. I don't have faith in myself. I've got faith in him. He calls me to live this life. I'm going to strive to live this life. I'm going to strive to forgive people. I'm going to strive to love people. Not just, I'm going to strive to do to others what they would do to me. I'm going to strive to be sacrificial. I'm going to strive to lay up my treasure in heaven, not upon this earth. You see, the great masses, you want to follow with the many? Oh yeah, you've got lots of people that want to amass all their wealth. Who are the, who are the people that give it all away? The few. Brethren, do you really believe him? Do you really believe that you can lay up treasure in heaven? You say, yeah, I believe what he says in this word. I believe that if you ask, he's going to give to you. I believe that if you seek, you'll find. I believe. And so you know what it's going to do? It's going to show in your prayer life. You really believe that if you lay up treasure in heaven, that it's really laid up there for you, an eternal weight of glory. It's going to, you don't want to, do you really believe that it's wise not to lay up treasure here? Well, then you're going to do something about that. You're going to live as though you really believe that. You really believe that you ought to be doing unto others what you want them to do to you? Then you know what? You're going to make some calculated decisions in your life by faith in him and say, Lord, I'm going to step out. I'm going to do this. I don't know how this is going to work out. I found this. You don't always have to know what the end is. Did you start striving to live? Live this life by faith in him, pleading with him, crying out to him. Help me to do this. Help me to make decisions. You have to ask, do you really believe that he is able to help you to live this life? If you say, no, you know what? It's not really what you say. It'll show up in what you do. And see, that's what he says. You got doers and you got people that hear and don't do. And there is a storm coming, folks, and it's going to blow down a lot of houses inside the church. And what's going to happen is if you sum up the people's lives and you really went back, they played with Scripture. They played with Christ's words. Do you believe Christ died for me? Christ translated me into his own kingdom. Christ released resurrection power when he died on that cross so that I might live to righteousness and die to sin. Do we really believe these things? Is this, I mean, brethren, hear his voice. Don't ever forget that on this road, there's someone there with you. He says, what? I mean, he preaches this. He says, to, what? Are, are some of you really going to continue down that easy road? Are some of you so in love with your sin, so in love with having your own way, so in love with your own interpretations of what religion ought to be? or what getting to heaven ought to be? Are you just not amazed by the religious people that you can quote scripture to? And they're like, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that, but, but what? Now you want to fill it in with your own opinion? Brethren, do you realize what you're doing when you do that? You're basically saying, no, I am not going to take seriously what's written in this book and what the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, that's the problem. People say, Lord, Lord, but they don't do the will of the Father. Are you going to say, Lord, Lord, and then not do his will? You see, that's what he's calling us to do in this sermon. Brethren, we're not playing around here. True faith. I'm not saying you enter through that gate to save yourself. I'm saying this. That if Christ, is, if, if Christ has so spoken to you that you hear his voice, then you want to go through that gate. You want to walk that straight way. You want to go down that path. That's not you saving yourself. That's every indication that he's speaking to you and that he's at work there. But if you're if you just to slough this off and walk on, brethren, we show that we've heard the voice of the Son of Man when he says enter by the very fact that we say yes, Lord, and we enter.
You see, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them. They're just spiritually discerned. Are you decided? This is the question. Are you all out decided for the way of life? Have you committed yourself to it? Have you made your choice? You know, there was a day, one of the messages I preached at the fellowship conference there in uh, Denton, Texas, I, I preached on the fact that, you know, our, the church fathers, uh, many of the Christians that we, uh, we, that we love, we talk about, we read about, you know, there was a day when people made covenants with the Lord. And in one of the messages that I did there at the fellowship conference, I brought out that reality, just how good that is to make commitments to, to be a committed people, to be determined. God helping you, of course. You can't do this in your own strength. But is this, is this what you're endeavoring after? Is this life what you're really striving for? Is this the life you're hungering and thirsting after? Will you dare say, this sounds too Arminian. This sounds too much like it involves my, my own will. <laughs> this day life or death there's no more than that he says therefore choose life or Joshua says choose this day whom you're going to serve or Elijah saying stop limping between two opinions brethren I'm going to say this to you 